What is the purpose of this series of programs that we'll be presenting over the station? In these days when religious presentations of all sorts seem to saturate the airways, is there anything with regard to Christianity that has been left unsaid? Is there anything unique about what we'll have to say that deserves to arrest your attention and interest? Well, let me tell you a little bit about what we'll be doing, and you decide that for yourself. First of all, on this program, as in the past, we will be examining the Bible in an expository fashion. Now, this is a classic tradition of historic Orthodox Christianity. Most religious or Christian teaching that one may hear in the church or on the media is done in a topical manner. Expository, expository teaching differs in that it begins with a given book of the Bible and follows the contextual flow taking all subjects as they arise and not picking and choosing topics to dwell on. Now, obviously, some subjects are more involved than others. They occupy more space in the Bible and they take longer to discuss. But the secret is to keep the textual and contextual balance. Well, this has the advantage of giving the listener a comprehensive view of what the Bible says. He not only hears what the Bible says on a given subject, but he sees how it relates to others. Now, any clever speaker or writer can take subjects out of context and rearrange the Bible to make it say just about anything he wants it to. You have to know the whole story as to what any given writer of the Bible is getting at before you can know what the Bible really says. It has often been observed that a text without a context, becomes a pretext. Before we go any further, I should explain to you what I mean by the historic Orthodox Christian Church or historic Orthodox Christianity. The word orthodoxy simply means ordinary. In the context that we shall use the term, the historic Orthodox Christian view is the one that has been ordinarily or most commonly held first by the apostles and then, according to the historic records, by the preponderant of Bible-believing church fathers through the Antonison, Nicene, and post nicen periods. Now, by that time, we know what orthodoxy is, and after that, it's simply a question of who is orthodox and who is not. It's ordinary in that it's historic. It's ordinary in that it follows most closely the context of the scriptures in a sincere effort to know, to teach, and to obey, and to preserve the truth of the Bible. Well, this differs from sectarianism in that it does not follow any narrow disciplines that lead away from the mainstream of Christian thought. According to the Orthodox Fathers, Christian leaders, teachers, and prophets of the Church are supposed to teach expositorily. That is, they were instructed to follow the contextual flow of the Bible and expound upon its meaning using only the Bible to interpret itself. They were not to fail to declare the whole counsel of the Scriptures. Now, they were not to avoid difficult subjects, they were not to soft-pedal unpopular teachings, and they were not to be afraid of the faces of people inside the church or out of it. They were to do this from the belief that the Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God. They were to go in simple faith, relying upon the power of the Holy Ghost to reveal the meaning of the Bible to them. Another instruction of the historic Orthodox Fathers was that the truth was worth telling for its own sake. A prophet of the Lord was never to use popularity and acceptance by religious peers as criteria on which to base his success or failure in the carrying out of his calling. It was simply this, how faithful had he been to the truth of the Bible and how clearly had he set it forth for all to hear and understand. 
In modern times, there's been a trend on the part of the religious leaders to play to the masses, to be concerned with popularity and the size of one's following, to use the pulpit as a stage, the congregation as an audience, the liturgy as entertainment, and to judge success by numbers on an applause meter or the size of one's following. Or This falls into the category of false religion, what has been called, and rightly so, the merchandising of religion. On this program, we shall follow the guidelines of the historic Orthodox Christian Church. We shall stay within the context of the scriptures. Now, I will not be concerned with whether or not the things I say are in or out of harmony with modern thought, modern trends, or modern religious movements. The burden of this program is to teach what the Bible actually says. I am not at all concerned that many in the secular and religious world will disagree with what I have to say. My purpose is to tell anyone who is interested what the Bible says and what it means. Now, of course, that is not to say that you do not have the right to disagree with what I say that the Bible means, and I'm not saying I don't care about that. Interpretation is not infallibly inspired, as the Bible itself is, though with men of God it will be inspired, but not infallibly. Now, you always have a right to disagree with an interpreter or an interpretation, but there's a caution here for your own sake to be observed. Be very sure that it is me or some other interpreter that you're disagreeing with and not the Bible itself. God will not be mocked here. Jesus said, you will be judged by the things you hear. So he went on to say, be careful what you hear and be careful how you hear. And the final burden of proof, insofar as your beliefs are concerned, rests with you. The Berean church was held up by St. Paul as an example because they listened with a ready mind, but then they went home and they searched the scriptures daily for themselves to determine whether or not these things that they were being taught were true. Now, this is the only method that I know of whereby you can be sure that you are being taught the truth. The ancients have held that there are four probable starting points in such endeavors as this one. Genesis, the Gospels, they being St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, or St. John. The Acts of the Apostles, or Romans, which is the first of the letters of instruction to the newborn church. Of these, the elders preferred Romans. It is indeed a beginning and a point of departure. It is the most foundational and fundamental book of the Bible because it goes into the simplest and most elementary aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ, explaining in a simple and almost childlike way the most basic rudiments of the faith. One is then in a position to build an understanding of the great salvation with all the pieces of information and understanding in place so that he does not get lost along the way. This is very important, more so than it may sound. The story is told of three blind men who ran into an elephant. One of them grabbed him by the tail and said, This beast is like a rope. Another, another had him by the ear and said, no, he's like a tent. The third man took hold of one of the elephant's legs and said, no, you're both wrong. He's like a tree. If we do not have an accurate view from the beginning, and if we do not stick with the contextual flow, then the information that the Bible gives out can be very bewildering and almost totally misleading. We shall begin then in this expository series on the Bible with the letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the church at Rome 
designated simply in most Bibles as Romans. From it we shall attempt to discover what it is about Jesus Christ, his coming, his life, his work, his death, his resurrection, and his present position in ministry that is supposed to be such good news to the human race. We want to know what it has to do with us today, what it projects for our future, and what it can do for mankind in a dark and a dying world. But before we get into that, we want to review for a bit as to what exactly the Bible is, where it came from, and what Bible we're going to use on this series and why. What is the Bible? Well, our English word Bible comes from a Greek word biblos, and then there's a diminutive form, biblon, found in the Gospel of Luke. Well, these words simply mean the book. There are many books written by many men on a whole variety of subjects. Some are mostly factual, others are not. Some are useful and important, while others are nothing but dust gatherers. Some books are good for us, and a great many are bad for us. But the Bible is not just a book. It is the book. It's the only book that has the right to carry the title, the book, because it's the only one written by the finger of God. Now, not only historic Orthodox Christianity, but good men everywhere, all through the centuries, have recognized it as that. Bring me the book, said Sir Walter Scott, as he lay a-dying. What book, said Lockhart, his associate? The book, replied Scott. There's only one book. Now, the Bible consists in two basic entities, the Old and the New Covenant, or the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us how the universe came into being, how man, animals, and plants got here. It tells about the fall of the human race and the condemnation that follows. It tells about the incredible wickedness of mankind in the days when there were no laws and no enforcers to keep them if there had been. It tells us about how God destroyed the ancient world with the universal flood as a judgment against a totally depraved race. It tells of God's calling of the nation of Israel and some of its history. All of this is contained in the Old Testament and concerned with the Old Covenant or the natural covenant made with Abraham's natural posterity. But since in historic Orthodox Christian views, God made a covenant of promise with Abraham, which was the new covenant in prophetic form. The Old Testament also deals prophetically, messianically, and symbolically with the New Testament as well. Now, this is what St. Augustine, St. Athanasius, and others of the ancients referred to as the analogy of the Old Testament that in one important sense it projected in prophetic and mystery form the New Testament dispensation and purpose. The New Testament is concerned with the history, the meaning, and the availability of the great salvation brought to us by Jesus Christ. In other words, it tells us about the gospel or the good news for man connected with Jesus Christ, his coming, his person, and his work. This has to do with the new covenant that God has made with all men everywhere who are willing to meet its conditions. The Bible is also known as the scripture or the scriptures. Well, it is a term which literally means the scripts, but it implies the holy scripts or the holy writings. This was the term commonly used for the Bible by Jesus, the apostles, and the early church. Another term for the Bible is the Word of God. This is the most meaningful and all-pervasive of any of the designations because it points up that in this book, 
God speaks and only God speaks in the final analysis. And this speaking is designed specifically for mankind. Christian orthodoxy holds the Bible to be inspired, infallible, and inerrant. What is meant by each of these terms? The word inspired is a combined term. It comes from theos, meaning God, and penin, meaning to breathe. Now this is the word for breathe that sustains life and gives breath. In other words, it means that God breathed into and out of the men that he ordained to bring the scriptures to us so that it was actually the breath of his own mouth that sounded the wording or the words. This is Orthodox Christianity. Infallibility means in this context that everything said in the Bible is flawless in every detail as to how it is presented. Inerrancy means that there are no errors in the Bible of any kind historical, scientific, moral, spiritual, or any other kind. Where science touches the Bible and disagrees, science is wrong. One plus one plus one is not always three. In the case of the Holy Trinity, it's one. If science says the sun could not stand still for a whole day, science is wrong. The God who made the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and established the natural laws by which the universe functions is not subservient to those laws. He is above the natural laws he made, and he is in control of the natural laws. Therefore, if God chose to suspend gravity, and hold the earth together by the word of his power, he has all liberty in his omnipotence and his omniscience to do so. That is orthodox Christianity. Now clearly the Bible makes these statements and this claim for itself, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the word of God came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote St. Peter in his second letter, chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21. In this passage, the apostle said that no writing of the Bible legitimately interpreted is any given individual's personal opinion. At no time was any of it the will or the opinion of man. Holy men of God only spoke as the Holy Ghost moved them. St. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And don't believe the modern and the Horsian translation, all scripture that is inspired is given by inspiration of God. That's not what it says. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, the apostle said that the prophets of old wondered what and what manner of times the Holy Ghost that was in them was speaking of when he talked of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And the emphasis here is what the Holy Ghost was talking about, not what the prophets were saying, but what God was saying through them. In the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus said that no man is to add to or to take from the words of the prophecy of this book. Are there no other opinions than these I've just given you in Christianity, in the Christian world today? Well, of course there are other opinions, but they're not orthodox. That is the point. Now, I do not wish at this time to get into all the nuances introduced by these words. I will lay this subject to rest for the moment by saying historic Christian orthodoxy believes in plenary or full inspiration. In other words, that all scripture is inspired and that all scripture is inspired equally. This is, of course, my position and the one which I will take on this program. Recently, I was watching a documentary on World War II. Well, it hadn't really been recently, a few years, I guess, now. 
In one of the scenes, President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill were sitting on the deck of a destroyer, or maybe it was a battleship. I don't know. I'm an Army, not a Navy man. But they were sitting there contemplating the grave implications of the world at war which lay ahead. President Roosevelt offered a substantial and meaningful prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And the two leaders, along with the fighting men, sang reverently and passionately all the verses of onward Christian soldiers. I do not mean to say by this that the nations of the earth have ever been truly Christian or that the church should try to involve itself in the controlling of governments. The Bible doesn't teach that. I don't believe that. But what it does show is that men in our society used to be more reverent toward God and toward the Bible as the Word of God. In modern times, one fears the liberation movements have been tricky and hidden things that have really been designed to make those things acceptable which used to be disgraceful and all the while it tries to make decency, honor, virtue and a belief in the Bible and in the God of the Bible seem disgraceful, embarrassing and intellectually dishonorable. In many instances this appears to have succeeded. Religious men, certainly those of the Christian religion among them, in their drive to be relevant popular and accepted, are losing their uniqueness and their message. They're backing away from most of the foundational truths of the Bible and offering apologetic arguments for the ones that they still hold to because they are intimidated by the outrage cries of unbelievers. This has created an atmosphere where people in general seem to feel that if you're going to teach the Bible, you're going to have to do it in such a way so as not to be too offensive to the atheism of historic scientific fantasies, the blasphemy of dialectic scholars and intellectuals, the educational brainwashing and destruction of our children as to their faith, morals, and values, and the sociological morass which includes psychiatry and psychology. Against this bigoted, biased, unreasonable, and bullying gang of moral and spiritual thugs, I wish to stand up and restate this resolve. On this program, I will teach what the Bible says and only what the Bible says. I do not care at all, not at all, not even in the tiniest way, that these views may be rejected resented and spoken against by those outside the professing Christian world or in it who have set themselves against God and his word. I have no apologies of any kind to offer to anyone for the holy God and his holy word, which has been the guiding light of tribes, nations, and civilizations of men on this earth during the nearly 5,000 years of recorded history and which offers the only hope of deliverance for a troubled, confused, and dying world. Throughout history, kings, armies, and false religionists have tried to destroy the Bible by burning it, by killing its followers, and so on. Today, the assault takes place in the classrooms of our schools and universities, the halls of our legislatures, the chambers of our courts, the living rooms of our homes in front of television sets. Yes, and even most disgraceful of all, the pulpits of our seminaries and churches. It is the most vicious and dedicated assault that has ever been unleashed, and the most widespread, all-pervasive, and dangerous. But Jesus said, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will never pass away. When the last army has marched, when the last parliament has sat, when the last court has held session, and when the last seat of power has been thrown down, 
this word of God will remain preeminent and transcendent. This and only this will be our humble and prayerful endeavor to speak of the Bible, from the Bible, about the Bible, and for the Bible. Let enemies tremble and let friends take heart. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Jesus Christ. Truth marches on.